We're really delighted to, to have Stephen Hunter with us uh, this afternoon. Um, I'm, I'm going to assume that uh, a number of you are already uh, big fans of Steve's books and know them well. What I, what I miss are his film reviews for the Washington Post, as a number of you are no doubt aware. You know, he started his... Um, his film critic days with the Baltimore Sun back in the uh, early 80s, then switched to the Post in, in 1997, and six years later received a, a Pulitzer Prize for, for criticism. Uh, but over the past decade or so, uh, he's, he's picked up the pace of his novel writing uh, and now does that full time, c continuing to, um, to have great success with the thrilling Bob Lee Swagger series especially. Uh, his new book, I Ripper, uh, marks a, a bit of a departure for Steve. Uh, for one thing, the story doesn't involve guns, um, but knives. Uh, it's also it's, it's also rooted in um, in some actual history. Uh, the Jack the Ripper slaughter of of five women in London in 1888. Uh, returning to the scenes of of those gruesome crimes and the ongoing mystery of of Jack's identity, Steve sets an Irish journalist on the trail of the psychotic killer. Uh, now, readers beware, as the investigation proceeds and Steve's story unfolds, his depictions of brutality can be uh, sometimes stuffed to, to stomach. Uh, but the book has drawn some uh, really great reviews. A book reporter called it, quote, as meticulously researched as anything he has ever done. Uh, and that refers not to just details of the murders, but, uh, but the uh, whole Vic Victorian setting. Uh, for instance, a description of the streets of London at that time when horses uh, were the primary mode of transportation is, said the book reporter review, quote, worth the price of admission all by itself. Book list declared I Ripper, quote, absolutely riveting. And a New York Times critic said, quote, the book's characters are great. Its race to capture the murder is beautifully tense. And it has one of the best twists I can remember in any recent historical thriller. Now, appearing uh, here with Steve is uh, Lenny Miller, who uh, uh, was his researcher. Um, in case any of you are going to be out there looking for uh, just crazy details about, about, the, about, about the Ripper story. Um, so please join me in welcoming uh, um, uh, Stephen Hunter. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. Uh, I'd like to begin by introducing uh, some people I'm very happy to see. There's the great Jim Grady, uh, Six Days of the Condor, Last Days of the Condor. Next to him is my friend from the Washington Post, the great Henry Allen, uh, who uh, another Pulitzer Prize winner, well, well deserved. Uh, my wife on the end is Jean Marbella, the best newspaper man in Baltimore. <laughs> Uh, John Bainbridge is my co-author on a previous book where I appeared here called American Gunfight about the 1950 assassination attempt on Harry Truman. Uh, and uh, of course, as, as uh, was mentioned, here's my friend Lenny Miller. He'll answer if, I, if you think you've found a place where we got one of the street names wrong, Lenny will explain to you that that street name was changed in 1953, and what we have is really right. L Lenny is a, really does know his Jack the Ripper. Um, I guess the question would be, there was a joke made, and I laughed at it, and it's certainly fair. This is one of my f only books without guns. Uh, it actually does have two guns laid in the book. Um, uh, one of them's really cool, and I can <laughs> I can rhapsodize about it for an hour or two. Uh, so get ready. No, 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 no. But it is clearly a departure for me, and you might well wonder why was the man mad? Did he not notice that there were already? 10,000 Jack the Ripper books. Uh, I did, but it was too late to do anything about it by then. Um, so uh, the way this happened was, after I retired from the post, I was sitting in my living room, and uh, I decided I'd been a movie critic for 28 years. You know, it would be nice to know something about the movies. So I set out to educate myself in areas where I knew nothing, where I'd just been bluffing and faking and sometimes out and out lying as a movie critic. And one of these areas was 
the musical. And I had a great summer watching musicals. Uh, I went through all the Fred and Ginger musicals. I went uh, through the Fred musicals of the 50s. I believe that Fred Astaire's existence proves the existence of God. I, mean, I don't know how else to say it. The man is absolutely a genius. Then I moved on to other kinds of musicals, uh, many of them great. Uh, I fell in love with uh, uh, Doris Day, believe it or not, and Ray Bolger, and Carlton Carpenter, people you don't even know about today, but they were just so wonderfully talented. And I was watching a certain famous musical. I can't tell you what because it'll give the surprise away. It would be a spoiler. And the hero was played by a beloved star. The story was beloved. Uh, the actress was beloved. The music was beloved. And I hated it. And the reason I hated it was because I hated him. And I realized that despite his charm and his fabulous wardrobe, his, his endless, his oceans of gorgeous tweed uh, made my heart beat fast. If you look beyond the tweed, you saw that he was really manipulative, arrogant, cold, in short, a monster. Because the time was a posit, my subconscious told me that he would be a very good Jack the Ripper. And I thought of that as a joke. I thought, hey, that's pretty funny. Most of my books begin with jokes. And in the next second, I realized that it was the best idea I ever had. And I just was so excited. I, I can't tell you how, uh, how much. And in my business, boy, you need that excitement uh, because it's all about energy. And the older you get, as you know, the lower the energy dipstick reads, you know. I was down to under a court. So uh, this filled me with the oil, as it were, of energy. And the only problem was it was an idea. It was not a story. And as too many people don't realize, they're entirely different. And it doesn't matter how good or bad or indifferent the idea is unless it is sustained through a story which involves technical considerations like characters, incidents, setting, tone and mood, description, action, and until those things come together, uh, you don't have much. Uh, however, in a couple of weeks after that, I was having dinner uh, uh, with Jim. And I, I have to say, I maybe there were a few martinis consumed. No, I think that was my bourbon phase. I'm trying to remember. <laughs> anyway, I told him my idea, not my story. And he went nuts right there in, I think we were in, I think we were in the palm. We fancy ourselves movers and shakers. And they had, for some reason, they seated us in the men's room. I, I don't, what do you suppose that was all about? Anyway, <laughs> anyway, uh, his enthusiasm was, I can't tell you how crucial it was to me because it made me think that the idea was something and that I, one could do, one could go to town on it. Alas and alack, I still did not have a story. Several years passed, like four years passed. And there's a fellow in New York named Otto Penzler who runs the mysterious bookstore. Some of you may be familiar with him. And he's an entrepreneur. He's got a little gene for extra sources of capiche. And one of the things he does is he publishes, he's got a publishing imprint, a mysterious bookstore uh, publisher, and he, uh, he commissions books or short stories. He puts together collections of short stories. He puts together, he publishes the great espionage writer Charles McCary, for example, publishes a bunch of very fine uh, mystery and thriller writers. And he's got a thing going that he calls Biblio Mysteries. Biblio Mysteries are books that turn on aspects of bibliophilia. That is fine books, first editions, expensive books, lost books, found books, 
diary books, journal books, everything that might have uh, vellum on it. That's sort of what his these books have got to be about. And it occurred, and he asked me to do one uh, for him, and I can't say no to anybody, so I said yes. And I was thinking about it, and I thought that maybe the Jack idea could be built around a found book. And then I came up with the idea of the diary of a madman, of Jack describing his crimes in great detail and trying to capture that book. I tried to capture that madness. I kind of had this idea of someone who was mad in the macro sense, but not mad in the micro sense. That is, he had a very efficient, elite mind. He understood how to get things done. He understood the system in which he would be op uh, opposing. Uh, but he had no idea that he was totally screwball. And he didn't see the larger issue that he was talking about killing people. So I thought it would be fun my idea of fun is probably different than yours. I thought it would be fun to evoke that mind. I didn't know at the time that not only were there 10,000 other books on Jack the Ripper, but several other people had tried and done the same thing. Uh, had I known, it probably wouldn't have made any difference because as a human being, I'm completely timid and withdrawn. As a novelist, I am shameless and without fear. So I would have, you know, if I get the idea to write a book set on Venus, I'm going to go ahead and write it. I Believe me, I'll try anything. So I decided that's what I would do. And I thought about scheduling it around each of his uh, obviously, each of the five canonical killings, I would restrict myself to the five because I didn't want to get into subsidiary theories of maybe there were six, maybe there were two before, maybe there were five after, maybe he moved to America and ran for president. You know, I just didn't, I just didn't, I wanted to sort of keep my vision really compact. But then I realized that I needed another point of view. And I had to be, I would be inside from Jack's point of view, but I had to be outside from someone watching uh, and reporting on the crime as it was perceived in society, as it was perceived in, uh, uh, by the police, as it was investigated. I need some way of organizing insights into the investigation. Uh, I needed another voice, and I, and I don't remember what set it off, but somehow I came up with the idea of entwining the, the diary with a memoir of a newspaper man who covered the case and who ultimately branches out on his own when he understands how inept and uh, awkward the London Metropolitan Police Department was and how it really had no clue of how to solve these crimes except to put more and more bobbies and more and more whistles on the street. And uh, I thought I would team him with a intellectual professor who would sort of be a faux Sherlock Holmes who would have insights into the case that, that would actually be my, quote, insights. And, uh, uh, and I thought that by juxtaposing those chapter by chapter, and I could, and one of the things you do in a thriller is you track the opposing forces, and you've always got to keep them You've, the reader's always got to know where force B is in relation to where force A is. It's kind of like a diagram. You've got to see them getting closer and going apart. And I thought that way I could do it. The other attraction of this to me was first person. I've written the vast majority of my books in third person omniscient. And I've always been sort of frightened of first person. Uh, then I wrote a book a few years back called uh, The Third Bullet, and about half of it is 
first person in the voice of the actual assassin in my telling of it, of Jack Kennedy. And I can't tell you what deep, just technical, physical, sensual pleasure it gave me to write in the first person. I don't know why that should be. I'd always been kind of afraid of it because I depend so much for my effects on manipulating points of view. And in first person, there's only one point of view. <clears throat> and I didn't see how you could generate suspense in the first person. And so I then, um, uh, what was I talking about? <laughs> Okay, okay. So, so, so that was one of the, so I thought I would have, I would get the best of both sort of structures. I would have the pleasure of writing in not only one, but two first persons, but first people, I guess you would say. And I would also uh, be able to juxtapose them against each other and in that way get the suspense effects that I uh, thought, which is where I basically make my living. And I thought that would be fun. I also thought it would be fun to affect a kind of mock Victorian tone to the voice. It's something Charles McDonald Fraser had done in the Flashman books. I adored those books. They were wonderful books. Uh, it was something John Fowles did in The French Lieutenant's Woman. He did it, of course, much better than I did, but he's actually got some talent, so he was, he was able to do it at a much higher level. But I found it also great fun. And I don't know where or why. I can only liken it to some sort of type of performance art or a actor's using, an actor using the method in which I, I concentrated so hard the boundaries between me and the characters somehow eroded and they became merged. And I found a voice and a diction and a vocabulary that I had never approximated. I used to try and sometimes change voices as a movie critic, but this was, I did this on a grander scale, and again, <clears throat> it was in and of itself uh, fascinating. Now, the next thing that happened was that I understood that in order to do this, I had in mind a very specific book as my ideal. I was not I was not groping in the vapors. I knew exactly what I wanted to do. I wanted it to be as accurate as it could be. And that's why I hired Lenny, uh, or I asked Lenny to help me. Lenny is my college roommate. He is uh, a, a devotee, and he was a, a Victorian literature. Uh, he is, uh, uh, he's got one of those meticulous, he's one of those rare people who's smart both in letters and in math. And that's a kind of a rare kind of combination of, of gifts. And I knew that he was meticulous and that he would be a very good researcher. And he was a fabulous researcher. I mean, he, as you can tell uh, at the end of the book, uh, the bibliography is immense. And he read and looked at everything. And he already knew, he already was a, as an amateur ripperologist. He's now a, uh, <clears throat> you know, I think a professional level ripperologist. I asked him to appear here with me in case any of you are ripperologists and have ripper questions that I can't answer. He almost certainly can answer them. And with that, I started. Um, there are, there is an additional publishing aspect to this. I mean, books exist twice. They exist as narratives that you write and they exist as a commercial product which you try and force through the sieve of, of commercial publishing and crank out what is as close to your ideal as, as you can get. And that was not an easy uh, uh, thing to do. Um, there was some resistance, I don't mind telling you. Some people did not get it. I, I, here's my, f I have one really funny, all, everything else is tragic and sad and melancholy, but I do have one funny uh, uh, story, I hope you'll laugh at it. Uh, I sent the first hundred pages of the book up to 
uh, New York. And what I was mainly worried about was the violence. And this is a very violent book. Please don't misunderstand me. I'm not selling. I don't do PG-13. I may not even do R on this one. Um, anyway, I, uh, uh, I, was, I was worried about the explicitity of the violence and that a nice white shoe firm like Simon & Schuster that after all publishes both Hillary Clinton and uh, Henry Kissinger, I was afraid that it might be a bit much for them. And the way I had the book, I started it with the uh, uh, with the uh, with the chapter in which the newspaper man Jeb tells the reader what he's going to get, uh, what it is, what he's going to get, and establishes his voice. And then I cut to the first murder, Polly Nicholson, in late September 1888, and. Um, we get Jack's view of that, and then the third chapter is Jeb's appearance at that murder site, uh, and the f uh, and that's how I wrote it. Um, and I made I said, "Tell me what you think of the violence," and her one comment was her this, the editor, um, she who must be defied. Uh, <laughs> I said. Uh, she said, um, you know what, why don't you move the violence to the front and really start the book off with a bang. <laughs> so <laughs> my fears of Simon & Schuster's delicacy were greatly exaggerated. Um, what, uh, you know, and, and then it's just a case of writing and, you know, I, maybe my great gift isn't literary at all. It's just that I know the skill of operating a big project to the end. And I'm able to do that. There's a billion things I cannot do and that I would not even try. But this was something that I taught myself young and it sort of stood me in great stead. Every time I start a book, I know that 300 smarter, more talented people are starting their books. And they're also better looking, they're much funnier, they're much better uh, public speakers. It's too bad for you that I'm here, they're not. Uh, and the reason for that is because they don't know how to finish the book. And somewhere along the line, they lose contact with it. Uh, they decide to take a day off. And then they get nervous because uh, they took a day off. So they work twice as hard when they get back to it. And then they think, well, I worked twice as hard yesterday. I can take another day off. And suddenly, four weeks have gone by, and they can't remember what the book was about or why they thought it was such a good idea. I've done that, but usually I finish. And uh, I was able to finish on this, and it was so great having someone like Lenny that I could, I mean, he became a website. Uh, jacktheripperrus.com and I could at any time of day or night you know you can let absence of details be an excuse for quitting but I didn't have that excuse Lenny took away that excuse and I could I could try gambits out on him I could try I could get obscure facts out of him if he didn't know it at Tuesday at uh, 2.30 in the afternoon, he would know it by Wednesday at 1 p.m. And uh, it was a, it just, and it was a great moral sustenance for me in terms of, maybe I should say a great immoral sustenance for me. It was just, it was great having that support there. And um, uh, it just, it went, I wrote, he researched, and that was really the story of the last year. Uh, as I say, I found addiction. I found a rhetorical style, obviously has since left me, that was Victorian enough to seem Victorian, but clear enough to be understandable by modern readers. And in fact, one of the things I did was I reread uh, John Foles's uh, The French Lieutenant 
woman to get the rhythms. The only problem with that is between when I read it the first time and when I tried to read it the second time, I had seen 4,000 movies and my IQ had dropped about 75 <laughs> points. So it was too hard for me. I, I couldn't stay with it. I just, I, I was dumb. You know, you have to be smart to get that book. And I was too dumb for it. Uh, but um, anyway, the other great pleasure in this book was I got to write the following line. And the line is, already his dark minions gather to fetch me to him. That's Jack discussing the devil. And if that's not the capstone to a career, <laughs> I don't know what it is. I mean, it was such a, it was such a fabulous kick to write that line. And even now, well, I actually, I think the line to be more proper and more, uh, get even purpler was, even now, the dark prince gathers his minions to fetch him to me. And you'll have to read the book, you have to buy the book in order to read the book, in order to understand in what context that line is delivered. But it's so cool. <laughs> um, anyway, um, I, I won't go, I'll spare you the publishing horror stories. We had some troubles. Uh, I have two disappointments in the physical, in the physical plant of the book. They love, I mean, one of the n n idiocies of commercial book publishing is that they can go from manuscript to book so fast, the production schedule is enormously accelerated. And what that means is that um, they do the cover design before uh, you even finish the book. And it's very disconcerting to have no idea how you're going to end the goddamn thing. And then you, you've got the cover looking at you. And the, it's like the cover knows, but you don't know. You know, the art director somehow knows. So they sent me this picture of the cover of Jack the Ripper, or of I Ripper. And it's basically our old friend Fred Astaire. And Fred has got his top hat on, he's dudin' up his shirt front, and he's just about to break into some, and he's wearing an evening jacket and a cape, and he's got a cane. He's just about to break into some Cole, Pat Cole, uh, Cole Porter tune. And uh, when I saw it, I immediately wanted to go see The Bandwagon or uh, Funny Face or the late Fred is really good stuff. Uh, but I raised holy hell and I said, look, the whole point of this book is to give you a different Jack the Ripper than the cliche. And I want him, one of the points I make is that he couldn't look different. That was the mistake that the London police made. They always, they thought he would look different. They thought that evil would have a different manifestation and that he would be, you know, if you looked at a crowd, you would know immediately that that was Jack the Ripper because of the top hat and the tails and the 18 inch knife and the fact that his teeth were filed into dragon's teeth. Uh, but the point of Jack is that, no indeed, he looked like everybody else. He moved to these crimes through masses of people. He escaped from these crimes through masses of people. He was completely, invisible while occupying shoes, socks, pants, jacket, and a body. He was as invisible as, as he could be. And um, so I wanted a dowdier uh, Jack, and that's why we finally got a shabby jacket and a bowler, because uh, that, that was pretty much the uh, uh, wear of 1888 lower middle class uh, London. And secondly, the knife. The knife on this was the one I lost. This is they justify this knife by uh, this was used like a like a pair of velvet gloves to slap me in the face several times. They call it poetic license. Poetic license, peasant. Stop. And <laughs> and um. This knife is something that 
I don't know, the harem eunuch would use to uh, enforce curfew among the girls in 1423 Byzantium. It was it's a, just a completely inappropriate knife. It is a dagger. Uh, daggers are for stabbing. That's how they kill. They get inside and they open holes in your heart. Jack was a cutter. He slashed. Uh, he used, almost everybody agrees, a butcher knife. Just a standard run-of-the-mill, shuffled, number five, Birmingham-made butcher knife. And um, uh, I, 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 you know, I say I begged, but I was very obstreperous in my objections to that knife. And uh, I couldn't, I, I lost that one. The other one was that somehow in the tumultuous and disputatious publishing history of that book, the map was lost. It would be much better if, the, if in the, the front space we had a nice map of Whitechapel. We got the white part right, but they left the <laughs> chapel out. Uh, and you saw the outline, they saw the, the lines of this very small area of London, less than a square mile, uh, in which these five murders either took place in or took place immediately outside of. And you could see how they were in relationship to each other. Uh, you could see significant landmarks like the underground station and the, uh, the, uh, the prostitute's uh, pub, which is called the Ten Bells. And uh, the pro what's the name of the church? St. Boltoffs. Uh, St. Boltoffs, which was known as the prostitute's church and such areas. One of the areas was called Fashion Walk. Uh, Angel Alley. Angel Alley, yeah. Angel Alley. Angel Alley. You could see where Angel Alley was, where all the angels came. And um, uh, that got lost. So I apologize for their stupidity. And, uh, and I will... Let's open this to questions, but let me just tell you, I'm proud to announce that there's such a thing in publishing as an orphan book. And an orphan book is when your, your editor, who's supposed to also be your advocate and your representative in the uh, extremely competitive internal world of the publishing house, when she leaves the house before your book is published, there's no one to take that place, no matter what they tell you, no one is going to be as interested in the book as that person. So she left Simon & Schuster on June 1st. Uh, my publicist uh, left Simon & Schuster on June 15th to go on uh, pregnancy leave and her assistants inherited me and she left Simon & Schuster <laughs> yesterday to go on two weeks of vacation. So nobody at Simon & Schuster even knows who the hell I am. <laughs> it's utterly without commercial rudder or interest or it's just this, it's the redheaded stepchild of publishing <laughs> gets beaten every night. Okay, so that's my story. I'm sticking to it. Now, uh, where are we on time? Oh my, I talked a long time. Uh, I didn't mean to talk so long. Please, uh, do we have questions? Do we have, yes sir? I'm gonna hog up some time and ask three questions and sit down and shut up. First is, uh, can I get your opinion uh, from both you gentlemen on the uh, not too long ago revelation that DNA on a stamp identified who uh, least sent the letters to the police? One, two, um, would, in your opinion, do you think, do you believe he would be apprehended today if he committed the crimes? And three, if there's a movie, should it be directed by John Waters? Uh, <laughs> John gave me a very generous blurb, and ours is no longer a view-driven milieu. It's a blurb-driven milieu. So he probably sold a thousand books for me, and he would be extremely opposite for that role should it come to him and I would if there is a movie 
you know, after Ridley Scott says no and Steven Spielberg says no, John Waters would be number three. The, uh, the second question was, uh, would he be caught by today's standards? And my, uh, I believe he would. Uh, the, 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 the 1888 was just the beginning of the modern age of police detection. For example, uh, they were just beginning to get telephones. They were just beginning to get telegraphs, all of those instant communicators being a great aid to the police. They understood the principle of fingerprints, but they didn't, uh, they didn't have a way of indexing. Like if they found the knife in the body and they found the bloody guy standing next to it, they could match those fingerprints to that guy's fingerprints. However, if they found fingerprints anywhere on the crime scenes, they could not, uh, they had no way of comparing them with other crime scenes. And their technique, like age-old ancient police technique, was to use snitches. And snitches were a great way of controlling the underworld, but they presume the existence of organized crime. They presume the existence of an organization and that people in that organization will know what other people are doing and have resentments or angers and those can be exploited. Jack was a one-off. I mean, he was not part of a conspiracy. Uh, I have a very definite idea of, well, I won't go into that. What, what, was, what was the first question? The DNA on the stamp that was Collected uh, a few years ago. Uh, well, there's a lot. I'm going to let. The latest theory is that DNA was found on a scarf that uh, ultimately ended up in the uh, hands of a DNA of a Jack researcher. And according to his DNA test, it A came, well, it had both Jack's DNA. One of the, I'm sorry, not Jack's DNA, but one of the classical, there are five classical Jack suspects. And most people believe it was probably one of them. And then there's no outliers. And there's theories for all of them. And this cloth supposedly had DNA from both one of the suspects and the murdered woman. Uh, Lenny, why don't you tell them about what's wrong with that? Uh, can you hear me on this? Yeah, well, uh, the first thing about the shawl is that, um, and this was a, a book written by Russell Edwards, and it was a shawl that supposedly was discovered at the crime scene. Um, the first part of this theory, and, and this doesn't exactly address your question of the stamp, which is another author's supposition, and, this, and the one that Steve is mentioning, the shawl, uh, first of all, you have to get past the preposterousness of a constable at the scene of the crime carrying off with him a key piece of evidence. Um, that's number one. Uh, number two, there was no record of this particular officer, uh, Constable Amos Simpson. There was no record of him being at the Catherine Eddowes crime scene. There was also no record of the shawl being part of what was recovered at the crime scene. So that's number one. Number two, the shawl uh, was handed down, supposedly handed down throughout 125 years from one family member to another. It was stored in the attic. It was never hermetically sealed. So the DNA was compromised on it. Um, what uh, Russell Edwards, the author, uh, did have a scientist uh, try to isolate DNA on the shawl, and for that, he had to uh, find a descendant of Catherine Eddowes, whom he did find, uh, to obtain DNA from her, and also a, uh, a relative of Aaron Kosminski was the uh, particular suspect that Russell Edwards was trying to prove was Jack the Ripper. So they had to find a descendant of Aaron Kosminski, which incredibly they did, although Russell Edwards refuses to name the person who was the descendant of Aaron Kosminski. What they did isolate was mitochondrial DNA, which is a lot different than DNA. I'm not a DNA expert, and I, I don't have but a, a passing understanding of the difference between DNA and mitochondrial DNA. But mitochondrial DNA uh, 
you can isolate that and you can determine that a per person, uh, in this case Aaron Kosminski, was in the same group as the group whose blood or semen was found on the scarf. So that was the scarf, the shawl, actually it was. Did I answer that question correctly, uh, to your satisfaction? What about the stamp? Okay, the stamp. Now this is Patricia, Corn Patricia Cornwell wrote a book some years ago, and uh, this was her supposition. And she named uh, the artist Walter Sickert as Jack the Ripper. And in order to prove this, and of course, nobody has proved beyond a shadow of a doubt that anybody was Jack the Ripper. There are, uh, there are a lot of suppositions, there are a lot of hypotheses, uh, a lot of circumstantial evidence. There's uh, authors who put forth a candidate for Jack the Ripper, uh, gather circumstantial evidence. Uh, they, in, in a sense, this is a great phrase I, I picked up from one of the uh, writers of, of uh, Jack the Ripper book, um, Philip Sugden. And he said what, what authors are trying to find is the least unlikely suspect. Uh, because there's absolutely no proof. Nothing has been uncovered other than this supposed scarf, or shawl rather, um, that, would in, that puts it as proof. And that does not prove anything beyond a reasonable doubt. Now in the case of Patricia Cornwell and Walter Sickert, what she did was she had, excuse me, uh, she had, uh, there was something like uh, 2,000 letters written to the police purportedly by Jack the Ripper. Now only 600 of them have, uh, have uh, remained from that, from 1888. Uh, Patricia uh, Cornwell uh, read all 600 letters. What she was able to do is isolate mitochondrial DNA from the envelope or, and the stamp from one of the letters sent to the Central News Agency in London, England, uh, purportedly by Jack the Ripper, and she's tied it, supposedly, to correspondence that uh, Walter Sickert has written. But again, this is they were able to isolate only mitochondrial DNA, and to my understanding, that isolation, that, that would isolate uh, the person to between 1% and up to 40% of a population. And in terms of London, England at the time, uh, or let's just take the East End with 900,000 inhabitants, 40% uh, of, my math, Steve touted me as a math expert, but let's see, 40% of 900,000 is 3,600, uh, or is it 360,000? You're right, exactly. So, so much for the math expert. 360,000. So that places Walter Sickert in among 360,000 people who have the same uh, DNA or mitochondrial DNA type. So it really has proved nothing. Now, supposedly, um, I've heard that Patricia Cornwell is coming out with a new book uh, where she has gathered some new quote unquote evidence um, that ties down this. DNA proof that she says that she has. Did that answer your question? Thank you. Let's let this gentleman in. Uh, Stephen, I, uh, I'm again, I'm again blown away with the fact that every book you've ever written, there's nothing in there that's been contrived. Oh. I, you know, I read a book and I get say, wait a minute, that can't happen. That's never happened in one of your books. Thank you. And I, uh, I compliment you on it. The other thing I think that the uh, you've proven, at least for me, that you can you're a very very accomplished author, outside of Bob Lee Swagger, <laughs> that you could write a novel on anything and it would be brilliant. Well, it has to have either guns or knives. Okay. I, I, I don't know. I don't think I could do one set in a breakfast nook. I, I, it's not me. <laughs> so, but I do have a question. Sure. That is. Um, I'm one of these people that believe, believe that English is an American language, and over there they speak something else. Uh -huh. How did you get that local, all those local collo colloquialisms and sayings that people use in London? Uh, could someone, uh, who, could you? I, I, How did you get the colloquialisms and local languages oh, okay. used in London? Um, it was, some of it I made up. Uh, <laughs> I had fun making up. Uh, Victorianisms. Um, 
it's sort of what I hope to be in the spirit of of the Victorian age and the way English was used in that. I used um, I there were some words that I assumed were ancient words that maybe weren't, uh, but they had. I, I mean, it's it's just it's just intuition. It's just a feel for what you're doing, and I can't ascribe it to anything except some sort of intuitive and I don't want to call it a gift it's an attribute and certain things sound right and other things don't to my ear and if you put two phrases next to each other I would choose the one that I thought or if my mind put two I would choose the one that I thought was most appropriate but I don't know what basis I'm making that decision on. So it wasn't research or anything? Yeah, it's well, some can of I, it is research. Well, I can didn't... I just add something, Steve? Yeah. Uh, actually, it was researched. Both Steve and I studied Victorian slang. Oh, okay. So that's okay. Uh, like blue bottles, yeah, so, which is yeah. slang for a police. Uh, right. We found yeah. that in a dictionary yeah. of Victorian slang. So Steve did actually have a lot of familiarity with the slang of the times. Right. Yeah, particularly for the police. They also, a word they used, and I love this word, bottlehead. That's what, that was right. their word for idiot, you bottlehead. <laughs> and, um, but you also have to be careful. I, at one point I had someone saying, you know, he wasn't wired that way. He was, and I thought about it and I realized that that supposes two things. First, that they're are wires, and although there were a few wires in Victorian England in 1888, there weren't so many wires that it would be metaphorically appropriate. Right. And B, it also presumes that there was a theory of psychology that someone would be put together, i.e. wired in a certain way, right. as opposed to uh, divine guidance or right. who knows what. So you just, again, it's, I, I hate the claim I'm sensitive, but it's just intuition, it's just okay. a feeling. And it seems to have worked pretty well yes, in this wonderful. case. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you very much. Yes, sir. One of my favorite detective stories is called A Samba for Sherlock, where uh, uh, the Baker Street inhabitant moves to Brazil with a, with a flame and uh, Jack the Ripper comes to visit. Are you, are you familiar with that one? No, I'm not. I play with the character of Sherlock Holmes because he was extant in 1888 London. The first book, as I'm sure you would know, was published in 1887, or the first story, and it came out as a book in early 1888, and it was beginning to catch on. And smart set people, I assume, <laughs> would have known it, and since some of my people are smart set people, they, they play with it. And, um, uh, I, you know, it was, I tried to, one of the things I tried to do was not just create the clothes, the hats, the smell of horse in the street, because it was a, not a, it was a methane economy, not a, not a carbon economy. <laughs> but I also tried to think about what were the prevailing ideas and not only what they knew, but what would they not know? Wired being a perfect example of that. And again, my sense of the past is that it's not only a place, it's a kind of an intellectual chamber with certain ideas that we have, or that they had, that would seem ridiculous to us. What are, what are some of the things they were, well, heroin, they were all heroin addicts, right? Uh, no, arsenic. Uh, what? Arsenic. Arsenic acid. Yeah. 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 Oh, excuse me. I want to take some arsenic. <laughs> I feel much better now. <laughs> uh, you know, and I mean, they just, their perceptions, and you've got to account for that. Sort of trying to find a way not to make it funny, but to make it sort of part of their every day. That's one of the things I, I struggle to do. Good details always work. Thank you very much. Yes, sir. Um, my question goes, can you hear me? Yeah. Uh, my question goes back to your previous career and your current career and maybe some advice. Uh, 
when you were a movie critic and I used to read you so I didn't have to read the reviews from that guy from the Times. <laughs> but uh, it seems to me you spent your whole career dealing with uh, either observing people telling stories or telling stories yourself. And, That's a very good point, yes. And, it's true. And, uh, you know, you're obviously a natural and very talented storyteller. And uh, uh, I've read most of the Bob Lee Swaggart books, and, you know, I think they're fantastic. Uh, I have a daughter who's a natural storyteller, and forgive her her medium, but she's studying film. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And she's sort of a, a renaissance studier right now. She's looked, she dabbles in fictional film documentaries, uh, you know, directing, acting, doing various different kinds of things. And she's faced with this new world of YouTube and yeah. indie festivals and yeah. feature films and, you know, all this stuff on TV. And going back to your critic, movie critic days and knowing what you know now about uh, being a storyteller now that you are one, uh, you know, full time, where would you tell a film student to go? Well, the first thing I would tell her is stop dabbling. Okay. okay. Pick something. Really? Okay. And become really good at that. Mm -hmm. I picked two things. I'm not saying I'm really good, but I did pick two things. I could not have picked a third thing. I picked the 800 word movie review mm -hmm. and the 80,000 word thriller, suspense, gun novel. Yeah. And I specialized, and it's the only thing, I, Henry used to say to me, he used to look at me, we sat next to each other in the post, he'd say something to me, and it'd be clear that I wasn't comprehending, and I'm sort of drifting off, and he said, oh, that's right, you're a narrative guy, it only matters to you if it's in the form of a story. Do you remember saying that? Nope. I never <laughs> forgot it. God, no, <laughs> no I, thought it was, I thought it was very good, I thought it was very true. And... Um, I, you know, I, the world is so full of dabblers, and I think that's another reason why so many people don't get what they wanted and expected. I, there's no bitterer place in America than a newsroom because it's so full of people who thought they were going to get something that somehow they never <laughs> got it. And one of the reasons is they don't, I'm only able to. I don't want to say master, but get comfortable with a genre or a type if I hammer my head against it, you know, 14 hours a day for 14 years. It's the only way, I mean, I didn't even publish a book until I was 33. It took that long. And I didn't become a film critic until I was 35 or 40. It takes that long to sort of get to do get uh, comfortable in the universe and get to do what it is you have to do. And dabblers never get that. They may be very talented dabblers. They may be very good at everything they dabble in, but you've got to sort of pick it and go after it. And uh, you've got to, you know, you think, I mean, it's, you so, it's as old as Socrates, know yourself. You've got to know what you're good at. When I was starting the newspaper business, everybody wanted to write novels. They all thought they were Dostoevsky. I wanted to be R. Stanley Bowen, who wrote Dave Dawson of the Royal Air Force. Mm -hmm. don't, don't you agree? And I knew exactly, you know, I knew what the market was. I knew what kind of books would be published. I didn't have this idea that my life was so damn special, that it was it was metaphorical, and that everyone would profit by learning more about my intimate thoughts and my, my, my pensées, as we call them. <laughs> and, you know, I wanted to do commercial storytelling, and I wanted to do newspaper film criticism, and those were multiple goals, and they were kind of related in that I think each one helped me attain the other and vice versa. And so, uh, you, I, so I would say to your daughter, start time. dabbling and start working. All right. Should I give her to the end of college or should I call her this afternoon? <laughs> <laughs> oh, I, you know, that's your call. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. 
Is there anything else? I think we're out of time anyway. So why don't we, uh, should we sign some books? Yes. Thank you all very much. Thank you, Thank you very much. So